it's from a book by J. Krishnamurti called Think on These Things. So I thought I'd just read a small excerpt and then it would be over. If you hold firmly to some set of beliefs or other, you look at everything through that particular prejudice or tradition, you don't have any contact with reality. When you notice something, what happens to you? What do you feel? Or is it that you have seen the thing so often that you have no feeling at all because you've become so used to it and so hardly notice it? And even when you observe something for the first time, what happens? You automatically translate what you see according to your prejudices, don't you? You experience it according to your conditioning as a capitalist or any other kind of ist. Whereas, if you're none of these things, and therefore do not look through the screen of any idea or belief, but actually have the direct contact, then you will notice what an extraordinary relationship there is between you and what you observe. If you have no prejudice, no bias, if you are open, then everything around you becomes extraordinarily interesting and tremendously alive. So uh, this passage occurred to me, um, especially when I was looking through the exhibition that I'm curated and trying to bring um, something that we may not be able to associate with as a reality closer from both sides in a manner that that wasn't screened in some way and as open and in as honest a manner as possible. And I found that really inspiring. So I hope Ma'am will speak a little more about it as well today. Okay. Thank you, Meera. Uh, and good evening to all. Uh, it's, it's interesting you picked up one of my favorite bits from Krishnamurti. Uh, and uh, in a sense, uh, created a wonderful prelude <clears throat> to exactly what I was going to, going to begin with. Uh, and Meera has actually been kind enough to give me a really open uh, agenda, an open book, as open as what she spoke about uh, uh, in her intro. And uh, well, that's very liberating uh, because our it doesn't tie me down to any one particular subject or aspect or issue or problem. Uh, and yet at the same time, when you are so free, <laughs> you make choices. <laughs> and uh, so I today do not want to, uh, I really want to, as Meera said, make this a conversation. And I would really welcome any of you to stop me in between um, and ask me questions. Uh, and uh, so that this is really an engagement. Uh, very frankly, I really don't enjoy these online uh, where I'm looking at a screen and talking and there isn't flesh and blood and people uh, to engage and interact with. <laughs> uh, and so, but we, we, we are all in what they call the new normal and we all have to adapt uh, and be as adaptable and resilient as the pastoral is. Uh, so I, I would really not like to focus too much today on what, uh, what all are, one has tried to do or uh, uh, or impact or influence or been influenced by, but I I, I would like to really um, kind of take you through my journey uh, and um, culminating, of course, in the exhibition that you spoke about, Living Lightly, which has been more recent. Um, um, but, you know, when I began um, uh, my work and went into the villages and communities about 31 years ago. Uh, it, I went in there to really uh, start working with women and organizing women. And I I was a young, young woman full of anger, not that I'm not sometimes now, both young and angry. Um, but uh, but, at the, but uh, those days, probably I was more of both. Uh, and uh, when I stepped into this this world of community service, activism, uh, it really was with uh, a lot of a lot of discontent and anger and uh, and wanting to really transform the world <laughs> and uh, uh, and particularly transform women's lives. <laughs> and uh, when when, I, when you look back now, I mean, 
you realize that when you're more looking for a problem, because that's what I was doing, uh, looking for problems in women's lives, you always find many. Of course, there were plenty in, in our society and in our country and in the communities that I was working with. Uh, it's replete with problems um, and uh, with our inherent social fault lines. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, so, of course, these were all getting expressed. But really what I'm going to speak to you today about is all that I did not go looking for and which fell into my lap and which came in. And, uh, and it's always... Uh, you know, when you're not really looking for something and it, you find it, it's always more gracious. Uh, and uh, so I, I really found a very, very rich world. Uh, I went looking for poverty and looking at women in poverty and issues <clears throat> which are embedded in this uh, impoverished state. And I just got filled with a lot of riches uh, from this world. And through that, one thing led to the other, one thing led to the other, and I, I and the journey kept moving on. And let me begin with uh, some of my first interactions when I started working with women uh, and organizing them over over their issues, the fact that they were really living in a complete culture of silence uh, and uh, in a state of what uh, I recognized then as complete operation. <coughs> Um, women who had never really stepped out of, the, out of their courtyards uh, and it was often only their dead bodies that would go out. Mm -hmm. That was the extent to which uh, they were clustered. Um, and there were a range of socio-economic, political, cultural, environmental issues because we, because I began working Kutch, which is a semi-arid region. Uh, and uh, very soon, I remember distinctly this woman who, uh, who looked at me and said, that have you, um, have you come here to help me? Uh, and uh, so I looked at her a little nonplussed, not knowing what to say. And she said, uh, how, is, how is your coming here helping you? Uh, explain that. To me. And, uh, so when I mumbled and I said something and, you know, of how this was also going to help me. And she said, see, let's get this clear. I will accept your friendship if, if, you have come here to help me and you allow me to help you. Uh, so she was, in a sense, setting the terms of the relationship right at the beginning and was actually what she was telling, what she was saying is that your liberation is bound with mine. Uh, it is not a one-way process. And uh, therefore, if it is bound with mine, then we are... Uh, and this realization that, uh, that it came very soon and uh, it came as a woman who I felt needed empowerment uh, and she very quickly pointed out that it was I who needed to be empowered equally uh, and a host of women uh, from across the region from different uh, communities actually ended up doing just that actually empowering me while I was also in a process with a whole bunch of other people uh, trying to do the same um, and uh, it was this this learning, which also uh, gave rise to another reflection, uh, which again came from these women and uh, what I learned from them, and which is uh, that women have been conditioned to do many things, but they've also been conditioned not to hide uh, vulnerabilities. And uh, this, to me, is really at the heart of resilience. When you don't really uh, try and hold your vulnerabilities uh, or uh, try and hold back your weaknesses, uh, try and conceal it, try and shroud it. Uh, and I realized very soon uh, through, through these processes that women were really coming together and they continue to do that across the world. Uh, you'll always just coming together far more easily. Uh, and where women come together, it was not because they they came together because they were weak, but they came together because they were they had the courage and the strength to express where they felt weak, uh, and uh, that that was a very deep insight that I really got from them, that a society, a community, a people 
who have the courage to express one's vulnerability are are actually uh, very resilient and very strong and i and i think that's the that's the world of um, oppressed impoverished women who showed this both uh, while working with women and on a range of issues right from the violence to the reproductive health um uh, a time came about 10 years later uh when the region i live and work in kutch uh faced a very huge uh, cyclone uh, in 98 and uh, that's when my journey took a little shift and i started uh, um a process of really getting a lot of civil society actors in the region come together uh, to support a lot of even then it was the migrants uh, who were working in the kandla port here uh, and who were the most affected and died in thousands um, because uh, cyclone and early warning systems were really not very really developed then uh, as they are today and uh, it led to huge amounts of devastation um, which actually went pretty much unnoticed because even then migrants were invisible and um, it was that that which triggered this process of coming together and bringing that realization that you come together when you must have the strength to shed your egos institutional and individual and come together to express your vulnerabilities that alone you are nothing uh, and you collaborate and come together and that led to the process of creating a network um uh, which came to be known as abhan and uh, uh, that that network and collaboration um was another another twist in the journey um because with that collaboration with that cyclone within a year uh, we came together and in a sense countered um and dealt with another cyclone within 10 months uh then a drought and uh, then within 2 years we had the earthquake in 2001 which many of you probably know of uh and then the year after the earthquake there was a flood so there were these five years uh of really being down and out uh, uh you know as a region and uh, uh repeatedly uh being made to confront oneself um, as one confronted the disaster uh and actually the collaboration the cooperation the working together working together across a spectrum of ideologies uh of histories of personalities uh was was a huge learning because uh, it it opened up another world it taught another world uh and uh, from from these experiences of course then i got involved in in a range of other calamities uh, across india uh the, the earthquake in kashmir uh, then the tsunami in the south uh and then the flood in bihar so on and so forth uh and uh, in each of these calamities uh there were there were two things that you one every calamity the community the people the people one worked with uh showed a world which really said that sometimes you lead uh, and when somebody is leading you follow and fly uh and sometimes when your capacities are high uh you take people when your capacities are high you take people along and you lead when your capacities go low you follow uh and this is really like uh, you must have all seen the cranes that fly in the sky you know we and uh, it's always the lead crane who is actually uh, leading the way uh, and creating the energy for all the others uh, uh, to uh, to follow and after some time in the flight the last bird actually comes ahead uh, and takes over and then the first one goes back again uh, and this this process of passing your energy to those who are following and then creating the space for them to come forward and lead the way and then you follow um that that constantly comes to the fore when you are really down and if if one has the ability uh, and i repeat saw this and one has the 
um, to stay in the flow of the calamity. And I'm saying this also because we're in the middle of one. Um, similarly, I, there, was, there were such a range of knowledge systems uh, that one learned and saw across communities, across India. For instance, in Bihar, which is so flood prone, uh, you know, communities, the, the poorest of communities who live in their bamboo and uh, um, mud structures, uh, vulnerable structures, but but inherently very strong, and and it was so beautiful that with them and they 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 make their houses. They call it dochaki, and you have they they because they know that their houses are just going to get completely flooded. The lower part of the house. So they leave the lower part of the house open and then they make a little attic just on the top. So when the when the water start coming down, they, they go up uh, and they let the water flow through their house. Uh, and this brought a very interesting insight that our, our, our communities, our indigenous communities across the country, across regions and countries, uh, but I can speak only from my own experience, uh, that when that you have learned others have learned and not the other way around which is what is done get me Where you have created a range of systems, cultural systems, knowledge systems, uh, which has which has accompanied nature and followed the ways of nature, uh, and this this is something which one learned after the other. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, I was just saying that uh, you know the range of disasters and calamities one was involved with uh, that. Um, repeatedly kept showing how communities have always been resilient to a lot of disasters um, by constantly finding ways and adapting and creating cultural systems to follow nature. Uh, and um, uh, it, it never compelled uh, or tried to rehabilitate itself by getting nature to follow culture, uh, which is what increasingly is we do, uh, you know, where we try and control uh, our ecosystems and our ecologies uh, uh, to to fulfill our uh, sense of satisfaction, our sense of pleasure, uh, and uh, that is how we have somewhere lost our ability to be adaptable uh, and really to be resilient. Um, so it was really the communities from across Kutch and across India uh, and in calamities uh, which whether it was to livelihoods, whether it was to reconstruction of their homes, or whether it was in how to handle people in trauma. Uh, there were a range of systems uh, which communities have and which they have lost increasingly. Uh, the more external systems have intervened uh, in their ways. Uh, while while uh, we were coping with the Kutch earthquake and post and all these calamities and created the network, um they uh, by the 90s uh, as you probably all know um you know we we brought in the 73rd and 74th amendment uh, uh to uh, to strengthen our local governance our panchayats uh and interestingly just after the earthquake <clears throat> actually most of the panchayats uh in a sense uh, their elections didn't happen because they because the earthquake came in and they pretty much got dysfunctional and disbanded. Uh, and uh, a lot of the work um, and the learnings what I had, and a lot of my focus really and interest has always been to uh, to really focus on community controls and community systems and uh, and localization uh, of the processes. So working and revitalizing the panchayats became a very natural process uh, that emerged from the earthquake and uh, um, through work with the panchayats and the decentralization processes um, one increasingly started realizing how much we 
as a society, as governments, as the state, uh, has completely de-empowered uh, all our local governance systems. Uh, uh, you know, whether they are in urban local bodies, whether they were the gram panchayats, um, we may pay lip sympathy to it, but essentially, uh, our local governance is entirely controlled with such a very top-heavy uh, bureaucratic system, and they really are the last leg of implementation rather than the first agents of change and transformation. Uh, and uh, the panchayats um, were repeatedly also, in a sense, teaching us many things. Uh, you know, while one looks at them often, uh, as Ambedkar put it, as uh, you know, den of vices and a cesspool of, of local politics, um, which, which yes, they are because they are part of our society. But the fact that panchayats are essentially such a plural world, uh, and they they embody uh, they embody huge numbers of systems of governance uh, in which they engage with this pluralism. Uh, and uh, there are hierarchies, there are social fissures, uh, and yet they engage with these, with plural indigenous systems, plural livelihoods, plural ways of thinking, um, uh, as long as they are in pretty much in control of how they are enabling their own society to, to cope uh, with the range of issues they face. The moment the panchayats become actually a part of the government machinery, which they have in the last 70 years, they uh, they cease to engage with their own communities uh, as one of them. Uh, they engage with them as uh, act, as an agent of the government. Uh, and that led to a range of processes and we set up a few organizations working uh, with panchayats um, and working not only on issues of citizenship, but really to empower the panchayat bodies and of us themselves at a completely new list emerged we really talked about people's engagement about festival about their knowledge systems uh, a range of small things all built into their relationships with each other and with nature which gave them happiness uh, and you said what has happened that has created such a distinction and what gives you happiness is not development uh, and what development is is not giving you happiness it's taking you away from it uh, and a, a few of the serpents came back and said, you know, we we are not interested in looking at happiness. What we have been conditioned from our childhood is really to look, to understand our life as being content. Um, and this, this really was a very deep insight that there is a difference uh, inherent in our uh, traditional societies, uh, which distinguishes between the pleasure principle and between contentment. Uh, and this, this has this chasm has just uh, increased, um, you know, as we have moved to a more globalized world and cities have uh, become far more centralized, uh, and we have we have created aspirations, uh, which has taken people away from who they really are and communities of their inherent uh, their inherent abilities. Uh, from there, I'll also move to another area of, of engagement, work, learning, uh, and that's with the whole group of artisans. You probably all are familiar with that. I am living in an area and in, in a region which is very rich with crafts. Uh, and crafts is a very, 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 very substantial part of the local economy here, uh, as it is in many, many districts continued uh, in our country. Uh, and uh, Artisans have constantly, uh, you know, brought us to a world and taken me to a world which understands materials, uh, which understands materials with their hands, their body, their mind, and their soul. Um, and it is, it is eventually all the materials to which we will all return eventually, be it bamboo, be it cotton, be it stone. Um, and how can we claim these materials back in our own body, with our own hands? And this is something that the craftsmanship and artisans um, continue to try and do and endeavor, uh, but are, of course, constantly facing challenges in that. Uh, and 
the the deep realization that no process of development can have dignity unless we really build upon the resources on which the poor people are actually really rich uh, and uh, that's really their understanding and engagement and skills and abilities um, and intuitive uh, knowledge of of all the materials with which they build their homes they their, they clothe themselves and uh, it is changing and it's changing hugely um, and very very quickly especially in the last 15 years uh, 20 years uh but that's exactly why one needs to reach far more with them uh and that's how a whole lot of work uh began in trying to revive the local cotton uh cotton in in uh, indigenous form of cotton in our region for instance grows uh with very little rainfall with less than 330 mm of rainfall uh and these are short staple cottons and um, we realized by the time the earthquake took place and within a couple of years cotton which constituted almost 80% uh, of the crop grown in uh, across the district um, was taken over and within 5 years by 2005 6 uh, in a span of just 6 7 years almost 85% of a uh, bt cotton uh, and the genetically modified seed varieties had replaced the indigenous cotton which was called sakala um and that's how a whole movement and a process began of trying to link the 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 farmers uh, revitalizing and creating them and giving them the confidence to uh, to stay with that indigenous cotton and to link it up with spinners and with weavers to enabling weavers who had moved into also very man made uh, fibers like acrylic to go back into uh, natural fibers uh, and more than just a process of skilling and reskilling and looking at material again really again one as one more element of local governance i spoke of panchayats earlier but that's not the only form of local governance uh, the other form was to really revitalize the local economic and ecological loops and to bring back that relationship between the farm uh, between the land and the loom um, uh, and uh, and the spinners and that that effort uh, is not just an economic or an ecological effort it's really back the social networks uh, and through that the social insurance uh, the social security of our marginalized communities uh, and um just taking you to another example of of these local loops uh, is that of for instance our local wool uh, something which i have inc have increasingly got involved with um and uh, you all probably or if you ask your parents um uh, i'm not sure if all of you recall that but you know if even these in most homes you would have your local blankets and when the winters would get over uh, you know everybody would wind up their woolens and put it Back and uh, would be scared that they would catch a little insect, and these would be really warm blankets, uh, given different names in different regions of the country. Almost all the wool that we actually wore or used in these blankets, or in our sweaters and our clothes, were largely local wool. Uh, of course, they were prickly, they were short staple, but they all came from our pastoralists and from our local sheep. Um, and then just our cotton shifted drastically um um and uh, a lot of the incentives given for our indigenous cotton went out actually due much before independence and then slowly was systematically completely thrown out once genetically modified seeds came in similarly with wool slowly uh, you know the more refined the finer wools the imported wools from the, the from the merino sheep breeds they slowly started coming in and these imports started coming in from actually the 70s and by the end of the 80s and early 90s um and then our economy started opening up we started giving import subsidies uh to a lot of uh, the import imports for importing wool and in a span of almost 10 15 years 20 years 
all our procurement of the local wool from local pastoralists from across the Himalayas, across the Deccan, across the semi-arid region of the country, where we have almost have the third largest population of sheep in the world, and yet we almost import 90% uh, of our wool from abroad, uh, and that's because we we just do not invest in the process of uh, of procuring our wool, of developing it, of working on the fiber itself, making it far more adaptable and usable, and drawing on its inherent strengths, and therefore again creating the shame that existed between the pastoralist, between the spinners, and the weavers. Uh, and this is this is so it is not just a craft; it is really an entire um, intertwined uh, livelihood. Uh, again, between the land and and the loom. Uh, and from here, I, I will just take you to uh, the most recent part of my journey, which in a sense brought uh, or tried to bring together all these various insights of indigenous knowledge systems of how uh, of how culture should ideally be following nature and continue to do in a lot of our a lot of our communities. Uh, inherent uh, abilities to to express one's vulnerabilities and make that one's strength. And I found that all these learnings that from women, from from uh, from our uh, local decentralized systems, uh, from our calamities, from our communities, and I found that it still survives in so many ways in a community which is always on the move. And these are the pastoralists. Uh, and um, many of you would probably have encountered them when you are on the highway and you will see somebody moving with their sheep and their goats and honk uh, to move for them to move away and then one moves on but one seldom stops and thinks as to why are they moving and where do they go and why do they continue to move despite such huge challenges and it was an interest really in the lives of astralists who are many of whom have actually increasingly become uh, have started leaving their livelihood getting sedentarized because our state uh, our governments our mainstream societies us people like us, uh, do not understand people who are constantly on the move uh, and uh, uh, we very quickly want to settle them and sedentarize them and believe that way they will be more secure but there is a very strong reason why they have a very very active and resilient economy when they are on the move and they are on the move and as they move they actually keep regenerating our vast lands and ecosystems because they are constantly providing manure to our grasslands to our forest and to our agri systems um, and yet they are diminishing and they are pretty much invisible uh, and um, uh, the region I am in Kutch of course is largely a pastoral land. I've been working with pastoralists for many years, uh, but as women, as panchayats, as artisans, as communities, uh, but not completely um, engaging only with their pastoralism. And when some of our other organizations began work on that, uh, I was inspired to uh, bring all these aspects of their lives. Um, uh, you know, these these inherent gems and jewels that lie in communities who are most marginalized uh, and which we are so quickly, um, uh, you know, pushing them, uh, pushing them into a world which is familiar and so similar to ours, uh, which, which itself is a calamity. Uh, and um, so it was really an attempt to try and look back at how these lives and how pastoralists and their movements are so intricately linked up with our own lives and we don't know about that enough. Uh, and why we must understand people who move and are mobile uh, and uh, why they are so resilient and why has this livelihood sustained for thousands of years despite so many calamities. No pastoralist has ever committed suicide despite going, despite uh, constantly facing hardships and because of the developmental models we have followed uh, and uh, it was in a sense to acknowledge to celebrate uh, to educate to reflect that 
uh, I got curating this exhibition that Mira mentioned. Uh, it's called Living Lightly uh, because that's what they do. Uh, and uh, but of course we do not want to leave them to live, live lightly. Uh, we would rather that they start living heavily like like all of us do. Uh, and uh, uh, and therefore uh, the entire PC environment, uh, our uh, our economic models, our political structures, uh, our uh, social behavior, all constantly drives them. Uh, to make it unviable for them to keep moving. Uh, and it is, in a sense, to try and ensure that we first understand them um, uh, and we acknowledge, and therefore then try and see whether we can enable uh, communities to move, to access the range of services that we all do. Uh, a pastoralist cannot access, a pastoralist child cannot access education, uh, for instance. Um, or we do not understand how a pastoralist child actually gets educated while they're on the move and integrate that with our mainstream educational systems. Uh, and so Living Lightly really brings together a, a slight a glimpse into their world. Uh, and by doing that, I really try to um, bring together a lot of my own insights, reflections, and learnings and wisdoms uh, that uh, I have received as a gift from all the communities that I have been working with. Uh, I'll, I'll stop there and wait for all of you now to, to respond, ask. I don't even know if it's audible. Yes, you're yeah, perfectly audible. Yeah, okay. I think just the video is uh, disabled because of network. But as long as everyone's able to hear you properly, I think that that's fine. OK. Uh, so a few questions that I'll read out. Um, can you elaborate a little bit about on living lightly and living heavily? OK. What do you mean by that? OK. Um, so you know, in pastoralists uh, uh, are constantly on the move. Um, first, we must understand why, why, why do we? Um, very, very simply, one is moving because they, they they have animals, uh, different animals, like from yaks to camels to buffaloes, cows, sheep, goats, pigs, and even dogs in Kerala, uh, donkeys. Uh, and uh, when you when these animals are on the move, they are constantly um, they are looking obviously for food and forage and fodder. Uh, and therefore, you move wherever there is forage and food, where they will find water and forage and fodder. So you you are not attached to your land uh, and you do not wait to produce or reproduce water and forage on that patch of land uh, on which you are settled uh, or which becomes your means of production. Um, a pastoralist will go where there is water, where there is forage, however far it is. Um, uh, which means that sometimes pastoralists are walking 1,000 kilometers, 2,000 kilometers, 500 kilometers. Um, and uh, over years, uh, through an understanding of the ecosystems, through the understanding of climatic variabilities, season, uh, um, uh, and various geographies, uh, they understand both scientifically and intuitively uh, where they will find forage in which season, where they will find water. If there's a drought here, then they will go move to another area. And so they do not become heavy on the land. Uh, they are not dependent on a, one parcel of land. Instead, they are dependent on whatever the land is offering them and wherever land is productive for them, uh, for, for their animals. Uh, and so the the investment for them in terms of the biggest investment really is the labor is the labor of moving with these animals uh, and the investment does not come in terms of a monetary investment uh, in trying to make their animals productive uh, and while these while they're on the move uh, it's not that they are moving because they're only consuming while they're on the move uh, these animals are uh, are depositing their dung and their manure, as I said earlier, on all the all the different ecosystems that they pass through. Uh, and for instance, in 
across region there is a very strong symbiotic relationship between uh, rain fed farmers and pastoralists because they will invite them into their farms now uh, because rain fed farmers uh, are not dependent on water or uh, irrigated water and uh, and therefore on pesticides and fertilizers chemical fertilizers so they will invite uh, uh, the the sheep and goat shepherds and they will actually pay them even today in maharashtra karnataka andhra pradesh telangana you will find that pastoralists are sometimes paid up to 800 rupees 1000 rupees a night uh, for uh, for penning their their animals and then they will move on to the next farm um, or they will move into uh, areas they earlier used to be in our forest ecologies uh, till the forest departments started keeping them out uh, in this uh, uh, in in this understanding uh, that our forests need to be isolated from human activity uh, while actually it's the other way around uh, and so um, while pastoralists keep moving they are contributing to the land and they are going wherever they find productivity they are not attached to that one piece of land making it productive and trying to bring all the resources to that land so that they and their land becomes productive which is what makes investment um, uh, the whole understanding of monetizing your economy very differently uh, and uh, so when i say that they live lightly they pick up their bag they, they often they will have pack animals they will put their put all their goods on their animals uh, their entire home um, you know whatever the little they have because they are actually moving sometimes for eight months nine months sometimes for a much longer sometimes much shorter uh, and then they will come back sometimes to their homeland uh, the native town but while they are on their move the family would move uh, they continue to move in a lot of regions uh, and everything is just packed on to the camel or the yak or the donkey or a horse uh, and uh, then they move they will just set up their home very quickly uh, with whatever material that they have and then move on the next day when they are moving to the next farm or to the next uh, grassland and it is this ability to be so nimble uh, and to move so quickly uh, and to be so adaptable makes them resilient Uh, and makes them live lightly they they live lightly because they can then move nimbly uh, we cannot move um, and our our systems of agriculture our systems of all other systems of productivity uh, are uh, are are not nimble uh, and are not adaptable because we 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 consume all the resources to make a little patch and ourselves productive in one place uh, and so uh, how you look at land for instance the pastoralist looks at land very differently they look at home very differently um, they are not attached to one patch uh, of land they are actually often attached to to an ecosystem uh, and this is what uh, i say that they live lightly because uh, they live very lightly on the earth Uh, and uh, that is that is why they sometimes will go down sometimes in in um, in huge climatic changes or uh, or meteorological calamities or even a huge flash rain or a flood or a deep drought they will lose everything that they, they will lose all their sheep all their goats a huge number of uh, deaths that they will face and slowly within a year or two years they will slowly start bringing it back because they they uh, are so adaptable they live lightly they move they live off the commons they have developed a range of uh, of cultural norms and ways of being which also respects the value of the commons uh, and so for instance if let's say one one pastoralist has a family has lost a lot of animals in a in in a calamity or in a disease um, the others will lend them all of them will lend them lend that person one sheep or lend that the pastoralist one sheep or a goat so that they slowly start regaining and this 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 um, this behavior of a valuing and see yourself as a community and it is automatically starts empowering the entire group not any one individual and that is at the core of uh, enabling them to um, 
to both live lightly to face calamities to go to go completely down in the dumps and rise again uh, and uh, uh, and bring that that culture of the commons to every aspect of their life uh, so they are not dependent on individual assets uh, you know and that 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 is that the process of uh, of the commune uh, and of true communion uh, is actually what makes them uh makes them thrive even in uh in very uh, socio economic situations uh which is why uh they live lightly because then they can adapt then they can move then they can support each other uh while all other processes have actually reversed that which is which is what i say call as living heavily mm. so you mentioned that uh, you know as you were growing up there was a lot of anger and discomfort which kind of got channel channelized into these areas um a lot of times we feel this anger we feel this discomfort and we want to do something about it but the doing becomes a challenge so what was it like for you in your own journey actually creating this change before i respond can i can i ask a counter question uh, what, sure. what what is the challenge in the doing hmm okay i will wait for that one okay. yeah. <laughs> i think it may also come from uh from the feeling that you may not have the resources to actually create a change or even just the confidence that your voice may not be enough to 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 make an impact mm but yeah this is just my personal opinion yes so uh, i i just want to <clears throat> begin with a small quote by a uh, which i heard from a pakistani sufi singer who once said that there is a difference between passion and profession uh, and uh, someone asked him so what is the difference and so the difference between a passion <clears throat> is that you do not you you just jump in into your passion and you do not really see what profits you're going to gain from it uh, uh, or you do not see you do not see what what losses you're going to face while in a profession you're going to jump in and you are first going to count what your profits are uh, and of course when it is said in urdu or hindi uh, which i don't know whether everybody here uh, would, would understand it is why i'm putting it into english uh, and that really is is the difference because when we <clears throat> start thinking of our doing uh, as uh, as a, as an act of profession as a professional act <clears throat> and i don't mean professional in terms of abilities and skill uh, but as a as a way of doing um that that there is always a slight fear that one may not succeed uh, that uh, one may lose what one you know even before one has gained uh, and that one cannot move forward without too many resources uh, and to a large extent this is exactly what i was explaining with the pastoralists Uh, that when when they move, they are not really afraid of what they are going to lose because they know that they are going to lose. They know they are going to lose. You you know that you are going to lose. You know that resources are going to fall short. Uh, you you know you are going to um, get a lot of um, a lot of setbacks. Mm -hmm. uh, but you move on because you you have an inherent ability. uh and inherent confidence in the fact that your resources are not coming from outside your resources are coming from within uh and uh and when your resources are coming within uh and you know you you realize the power uh that you can create within a community so when you when you start working with somebody you start engaging with the community 
you realize that if the power is coming from within uh, and you're not waiting for power from outside, which is financial resources, intellectual resources, people, support, government help, then uh, that, that confidence that you get uh, just makes you go forward irrespective of Uh, I think to some extent that how all of us began. Uh, many of many today, many people can of my Really, that thousand rupees almost six months after we started work. Uh, uh, we had, of course, vendors, um, uh, and then, um, uh, called Janvikas, which really supported young people. you to to lose so when when things start moving start ma'am hello has it cut So should I do it on the phone only? Uh, Ma'am, my video is disabled from a long time. Shall I go out and come in again? You are? Okay. 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 So as I was saying that when we um, when I started work, uh, there really was no fear of, uh, of losing anything. Uh, and uh, you, you went in there entirely because you know many other people uh, like you who are moving forward and doing this work. Uh, and uh, yes, you, that, that really was the confidence and, and the power you get uh, to, to, to move forward. And, and it, you know, when you when one puts oneself outside one's own comfort zone, uh, then you completely know that you really have nothing to lose. It is when things start getting comfortable, as it does invariably, when you start working for some time and then things start getting comfortable and uh, you know you meet some successes at that point, then then that's when you start getting worried to take the next step. Uh, but when you have when you have just taken your first step, a child is not scared of walking and falling, right? And that's how that's how we are when you start when you start doing something. And somehow we have to retain that power to be a child that is trying to walk constantly, even after years of working or having gained some experience or gained any success. Uh, that you have to constantly keep going back to being that child and taking the first walk. Um, so this question is in the context of creating spaces for women to earn their livelihood. With so many organizations supporting uh, their livelihood, is there a need of new ones to emerge? If yes, get you, uh, Mira. What was the last? Uh, so it, there are a lot of organizations that do support um, women's livelihood. So is there a need for new ones to emerge? If yes, what should we keep in mind in terms of the geographical area, the production and distribution process, scale, etc.? So um, yeah, there are, of course, hordes and hordes of organizations today uh, working on issues of women and livelihood. Uh, um, 
I think there are two things that have happened over over the last, I say three four decades. I mean the the women's movement or women the rural women's movement really began in the late 80s, uh, in the mid 80s, late 80s, and since then we have come a long way uh, in terms of understanding livelihoods and. Um, and incorporating, integrating uh, women into different uh, into different production processes. I think one thing that uh, at least I have uh, been a little wary about is to uh, is to look at um, at livelihoods as only an income generating source. So, for instance, sometimes one often draws women into uh, into completely uh, new income generating sources only because they will be viable or successful somewhere else. Um, uh, and of course, the most most uh, uh, pedantic and common one is getting women to tailor, <laughs> you know, so uh, and, and, and processes like that. Um, I feel where livelihoods are inherently linked with women's uh, ecological resources and where they understand those resources. So where, where you know it's linked with the land or with the linked a range of traditional livelihoods, inherent skills. It's very important to understand what lies not only in what you can see uh, visibly at that point with the women then, but to really go back and look at their entire biocultural system and see uh, what are the livelihoods that can emerge uh, from that region. So for instance, if one is if one is in uh, uh, you know, in the remote parts of Motihari in Bihar, then you will find that I'm just giving an example that you find one can get women into a range of alternative livelihoods, and yet you will see such an abundance of, for instance, the narcot grass there, and the range of things that can be that can be created, understood um, through that through that one uh, uh, material. Uh, more important, women there understand that material very well because they have lived with it. It is part of the genetic memory, part of their community knowledge system. And it is therefore important for external actors to start engaging with the material with which communities live and try and develop livelihoods which, uh, where the raw material uh, is available within a localized region, because then that livelihood, at least the 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 source of that livelihood, is more control of the community and the women, rather than making them dependent on first getting the raw material from let's say thousands of kilometers away, and then going and trying to market it thousands of kilometers away, and therefore how to ensure that the the cycle of production consumption source uh, remains largely within uh, as far as possible within the the agency of, of uh, communities and women uh, and then enabling that bringing in technology bringing in innovations bringing in of course new and contemporary understandings so i'm not saying that you have to freeze uh, knowledge systems uh, in the way they, they stood with communities maybe uh, half a century ago or even 10 years ago so one has to bring in our own curiosity and understanding with the resources and material that communities live with and link women with that uh, rather than draw women's livelihoods into areas which we are more comfortable with and which we understand much more as external actors. Um, having said that, that that's, that's true for women who are in, in rural regions, uh, but of course today, uh, a huge population of our country, 60% of them have moved into urban areas and urban livelihoods uh, and sources have become a critical uh, aspect for them, far more maybe than for rural women. Uh, and therefore, there one really has to innovate with a range of livelihoods. But again, it's very interesting that you'll find a lot of women, even women migrants who have come in and we will try and draw them into uh, into service sectors and manufacturing uh, or urban consumption, uh, but often you will find, but often you will find that that uh, the women uh, uh, who have come in from other regions also carry uh, their own skill 
uh, and but nobody is asking them about that. Uh, and therefore, it's, I would say the first step is really to start exploring the inherent knowledge, skills, abilities that women have. Well, that must be explored first, and then link the livelihood with that. Uh, and the resource that is available locally in many cases you may find that neither is available that's when one starts exploring and looking at a range of uh, of services and production systems which may find uh, uh, takers in consumers in a local environment um, and where but where women would have to get into completely new skills um, and then you will also one has to engage and confront with sometimes skills uh, or sometimes livelihoods which uh, which you may not be very comfortable with but which women have chosen to do so for instance let's say sex workers uh, and uh, this is always a dilemma that you will find women in urban areas on the fringes on the margins um, engaged in for instance sex work um, now what what are you going to do are you going to try and shift them or try and get them out of the livelihood or are you going to ensure that you are uh, enabling them to get their entitlements, get their rights, to safeguard the livelihood that they have already engaged in? So I think there are a range of things. One is entitlements and safeguarding livelihoods that are already there uh, first. Uh, the other is to first look to look at their own inherent abilities, strengths, and local resources. And then third is to look at what is required in the environment around. Uh, and then adapt and re skills um, to create new livelihoods. So, in the process of this, um, of re reorienting, um, there's always there's this question of not feeling um, like you are part of you know the community enough, and especially you're not associated with. Them in as in aspects such as language or any part of their culture. Mira, sorry, which I'm might have otherwise you. been. Sorry, Mira, I'm not hearing you very clearly. Can you repeat that, please? Uh, is it clearer now? Yeah, yeah, this is clear. Okay, so in connection with what you said last, there's there's this feeling of not um, not feeling like part of the community enough to be able to make this kind of systemic change, especially when. You're unable to associate with them in aspects of their of their culture, such as language, and that would have otherwise been a connecting factor between you and the community in order to be able to understand them better and possibly even help. So, what is it beyond, you know, a common cultural understanding that can create human bonds and even friendships? <laughs> Very good question. Uh, of course, they, they, see, what is, let's, let's first kind of explore what we mean by culture. Uh, and so whatever the entire realm and arena of human communication, human language, human behavior, human practices is really the realm of culture. Uh, and it is just that they are distinct uh, and uh, and unique with different communities, but uh, and that's why we uh, we somehow tend to look at culture as always being very distinctive, and they are because they're always drawn invariably from the ecology, the ecosystem that that community or that human population lives in, um, and that's why those cultures are distinct because they are distinct. But uh, what is what is uh, generic? Uh, an endemic to all these distinct cultures is the ability to love, to empathize, uh, to to uh, we are all we all embody a, a same set of emotions, and I'm saying same. There may be similar ways in which we express those emotions, but these emotions are essentially the same. Uh, and um, even when we are we are trying to dive deep into a context to so that we can create deeper bonds of work and friendship both um, even before that the 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 process or the vehicle or the tunnel through which we start engaging with that culture is 
is uh, through um, this this essential world of emotions uh, and uh, like i said that uh, I'll, let me give you an example for instance when i first went to some of the villages uh, in in kutch which were right on the border of india and pakistan people were very suspicious of who i was especially with my short hair and they felt that i i was part of some intelligence and because those are the only uh, it was only our security agencies who used to function in those areas and uh, suddenly two women land up there and they wonder why uh, you know who these women are and they were very sure that we were we were actually uh, men dressed as women and we were from the security agencies uh, and those were also that was also a time when there was a lot of drug peddling happening in that area and so people were very suspicious so the moment we would walk in and uh, communication would be very very quick and fast with zero mobiles obviously and zero phones also uh, but their their communication systems were just so super efficient that village after village even though they would be 5 kilometers apart would realize that there are these bunch of two women who are roaming around and they will come to your village and don't allow them in and so they would shut the doors and windows uh, as soon as i go and knock on some some contact name that i would have got and uh, so where is the question of even engaging culturally uh, with them because they won't even open their doors and windows and uh, the only thing left really was for me me and uh, my friend and uh, partner who was you know both of us used to go to these villages three of us actually to sit outside their hotels or their verandas and uh, we would just wait there because there won't be another bus to take us back Uh, 80 kilometers away, so we sit there and sing. Uh, and um, while we would sing, partly out of desperation, not out of any great strategy, and also just because we like singing, slowly windows would open up, and the women would come out, and they would first peep out, then they would come out, then they would sit, and uh, then slowly they would start humming, uh, and then they would be curious about the song, and then they would share a song, and then. one would get a little peek into their own culture and that's when the cultural engagement would begin but what began first was really just pure emotional bond and and i think uh, but even to open up that emotional bond one has to first go in if one wants to feel whether the water is hot or cold and feel that emotion one has to, one can't just you know dip your little toenail into the finger you have to you have to fall into the water uh, and so whether it is cultural engagement or whether it is relating at a purely emotional level at a human to human plane one still has to dive into the relationship one has to engage fully uh, and open oneself up completely uh, and it's only when you open up completely that something else can enter and when that enters then the emotions meet and when emotions meet then cultures open up when you dive further into each other's cultures then a new world opens up then many many possibilities open up hmm. uh can you speak a little bit about you know so you went you studied abroad and then you came uh, back to the realities of uh, a different context that you may have seen um through different eyes perhaps before um you studied and came back to this sort of immediate reality so what was it that first um brought you away from it like when you did go to study what brought you back ah what brought me uh when i i went there uh somehow with uh, just an intuitive uh, um, intuitive feeling um, and an intent and i think intent is always very strong uh, it's it's a uh, what do we do that there, there is intent and there is also an inner intuitive feeling and it was a combination of the two which probably um, made me tell everybody before i went that i am going to be back uh, well when i went there it wasn't so difficult to come back um uh, it's interesting i mean all the stuff that you are seeing in the usa today uh is uh, is <laughs> i mean it is 
not starkly different from what um, experienced or saw when one was there. And that's not to say that um, one also saw all the beautiful things there and, uh, you know, such a enabling environment to work, to study. Uh, and yet, when you scratch the surface, uh, I did not like what I saw. Uh, and uh, also somehow, I think it was the studies that I was engaged in and the conversations I used to have uh, with the people and the faculty. And I realized the first world and third world uh, and uh, how the first worlds intervene so blatantly, so shamelessly. Uh, in every society, in every uh, every culture, in every polity, uh, um, uh, in a completely entitled way, uh, and uh, that uh, I think that the same reasons which made me work with uh, marginalized communities made me also come back from uh, from the USA because I didn't want to be a part of that. So that that was easy. It was not really it was not difficult at all. Uh, and uh, uh, when I when I came in here, uh, it was interesting. When I came in, I was not sure I would be able to, uh, you know, find doors opening into uh, into rural spaces. And I was very, uh, I was really very uh, and hung up that I wanted to go to a really remote area. Uh, and uh, I mean, I don't know if it was some kind of self-inflicted challenge that I wanted to prove to myself that I could go and be in a very remote, uh, far off area. And at that point, I actually had just gone through a very severe drought. Uh, and uh, that's what suddenly made me want to come come here. Uh, not before, just before that and before uh, why, so I came, well, I actually came into Kach and began uh, looking and working and exploring Kach within three, four months of coming back. But in that intervening two, three months, I had a slight doubt that uh, I would be able to, uh, you know, uh, be able to make this transition uh, and that the rural communities or people or civil society then would really accept this. Uh, and uh, I somehow, uh, I think somehow a little foolishly thought maybe I should transit by uh, first getting into the writing world and you know being an activist journalist and then moving into real activism uh, well thank god i didn't take that route i uh, uh, i i actually went and also uh, you know met some journalists and uh, to try and explore and uh, uh, did a couple of writings and stuff like that and realized that no no all everything is the virtual um, and everything is vicarious uh, for me uh, at that point and if I really need to uh, need to uh, you know walk the talk then I had to dive in whatever it takes uh, and that is how I started exploring people and groups who could support and help and uh, and I came in and well that, yeah it, it was uh, it was just like that and of course when one comes in it's not it, nothing is what nothing prepares you for uh, for the real world in that sense uh, and at that point everything that I had studied um, uh, here or uh, abroad uh, felt utterly useless uh, and felt utterly irrelevant uh, to what I was uh, experiencing every day uh, in, with, with, uh, in the villages or in the community. Nothing really had prepared me for to see what I was seeing. Uh, and therefore, one was interpreting uh, everything of uh, and that was what is so beautiful uh, that uh, in a sense, I had the experience that you face is, is when it is so intense, you actually in that moment lose, lose all that. Uh, there is nothing that you can draw upon, <laughs> you know, because you really have lost all the pegs uh, that you were relying on as a educated, privileged being. Uh, and uh, uh, and so it just throws you to the, to, the, to the winds and you then all your pegs and all your anchors are lying in that real experience and when you start flaying your hands and legs and trying to trying to get your support from that 
uh, is when actually relationships build up uh, because then the the tables turn and the communities and the people you are working with or you have come to are in a more powerful situation than you are uh, and so your privileges are taken off for a moment in a sense and they are the more privileged ones who are enabling you to adapt to to the this new world and uh, so you become a student and you become a learner uh, and you don't you you're not allowed that privilege to feel that i know uh, you are entirely in the space of i don't know uh, and that is how then slowly uh, the glass starts filling up uh and uh, new experiences get poured in and somewhere halfway through your your old uh, what you learned uh, what you heard what you uh, you you all your all your the so called educational pegs slowly slowly start coming back to you okay so are uh, you speaking about um you know your own experiences in how the ground reality was very different from and the experiences that you had were very different from what was taught theoretically um so do you think there's a need to bridge this gap and as educators how do we do that um you know as i as i said of course uh, things have changed quite a bit also uh, uh, you know in the last few decades uh, within the educational processes and systems that i think most uh, most educational institutions and educators today are giving a lot of um, much more importance to uh, you know to uh, getting into uh, life experiences to getting into field experiences uh, and uh, applying or testing a lot of the conceptual frameworks with um, uh, with direct field experience uh, this happened much less when when we were studying uh, so i think to some extent uh, it is already it's already happening in a way uh, and i wouldn't say that there is a complete uh, disconnect from uh, the classroom to the field but in terms of uh, connecting to uh, linking theory uh with community with 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 direct experience uh i think it, you know in the issue really is with our with our educational frame and our uh, and as educators uh, all said and done we have however alternative however uh, you know we have tried to shift time and over the year uh from an education system on a lot is on a lot of western premises uh and when i say western i'm not talking about the content i'm talking about the uh the but uh when we go when we are interacting with uh community and in um we find you know what circular and the to life kind grasp uh, its inner reality that itself is is pedagogically different essentially uh and i think this is at the heart of the disconnect so as educators i think we somehow need to start bringing in uh the frameworks and the ways of looking the ways of seeing uh you know um uh, in a in a way which is far more congenial far more aligned uh 
uh, to the way uh, our society functions. Uh, and I and I and every society functions differently. Uh, question and seeking in a way aligned that he will be able to much uh, very different responses to the ones we find when we go through a very Western framework of conceptualization and theorizing. So uh, before I move on to the uh, thank you for seeing the and also my livelihood mind the is livelihood with the thing then culture so in relation uh, to what you were speaking um can can just a little bit which are the women's movement And in uh, a few years after we had begun the movement, uh, which is Kachmaina Vikas uh, there was uh, a little But India, uh, uh, and uh, it led to a lot of things. For instance, let brought down across the country. Well, there was no dark and dense and beyond. Um, and uh, so similarly here too. Um, while the approach to work was largely looking. Uh, in passion. Uh, looking a life giving engagement. Every learning and how, uh, so literacy. Also, the curriculum that uh, we were working on and developing with another resource organization, Delhi College. Um, today, uh, in the real life, and books and violence turned into literacy. And so, so then I think up to a second, and then she had completely forgotten. And she came back to this camp. And uh, while the camps were going on, the literacy process was on the discovered who uh, only. Uh, 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 you know that the So, uh, so when starting a, a, a magazine, uh, or actually almost like a newspaper for women, uh, and the call, and she became and out with her. Would they, would they really, the stations would be 
on society or uh, as uh, popular to uh, and uh, then of course from her drawing whatever she was seeing and observing uh, as it happens the moment she realized that she has a talent then getting her to want to talk to in this and talk and like actually can carry out level i think uh myself looking at all rather than drawing over the years uh, uh and i asked can you to share them and uh, and Okay. Yeah, I just sprung that. You know, these drawings and illustrations and uh, this narrative, this comment, uh, uh, and in a sense, she had really. was taking the creative and then uh now uh, with other women uh and uh, women to look at her illustration and she had And that's how two hundred illustrations, and uh, and then I wrote wrote for it, and she my text. I wrote for her illustrations, and that's how uh, together we kind of documented uh, the moment as she saw it, and as uh, I experienced it with her. Okay. So that that was what it was. <laughs> Uh, can you also tell us a little bit about uh, the Kach Mahila Vikas radio station? But any man. Uh, well, Mira, I must tell you, say you have done a lot of uh, research on all that I have been tampering with. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, when well, the radio station came. uh and again it was issues hardcore political economic cultural ecological issues that women were fear heading leading uh fighting into the legal battles uh and of course the conflict and fight actually began in their homes and they were trying to transform that uh and sometimes they were finding it easier to transform actually transform your own inner world um there 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 in ujjayi uh Literacy level, um, were not accessing uh, even what we just were bringing out as uh, as a uh, 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 you know uh, um, through the stories of the world. uh you know uh, creating uh, uh new scripts every day in their own life uh and so we said and also you know tv has really become big by then so the 24 by 7 has mm-hmm. or just
um, even even in the actually I said but uh, the companion to hordes of people, especially also people on the move. As I told you earlier, the pastoralists, a lot of them were constantly on the move. And so radio really was all of the country. Country. Our, our neighboring countries were doing very creative work with the radio and that's a community radio. And the community uh, themselves. from uh, and initially uh, we, were, we didn't get permission from a transmitter so we signed up with all India radio uh, to get a get a slot uh, and that's how Thursday to one new and the season will get produced, they will come into the studio all they are all coming from villages and cathedrals. They all come from buses. They would enact it, and most of them of course complete the script. And uh, then one episode would be done and uh, The master copy would be sent. Somebody in Ahmedabad would pick it up, take it to the All India Radio office, and it would get transmitted and broadcast uh, on a Thursday evening. And it slowly became. It was one story which was unfolding. After being a Mahila Sarpanj. Uh, and in a, in a. So it, it stayed connected to the magazine that I spoke about earlier called Radio. Called Radio Just, uh, while the magazine the episode of serial unfolded was also a imaginative, uh, imagined village called Just. And uh, uh, this it circled around a woman uh, who had just come into the panchayat because remember, Panchayati Raj had just, the amendment had just come in in 93. And the first cycle of Mahila Sarpanchi really had begun trying to, uh, you know, uh, it was all things to inspire them, to give them more confidence that one Mahila Sarpanch and all her travels on it uh, slowly became very popular. Radio Ujjas actually went through those uh, 
broadcast for a full year and then on demand by the people in the district who also offered to fund it because through crowdsourcing which is you know that is the probably our first experience of crowdsourcing uh, and uh, uh, they should be on and so all in the radio gave time for the radio program to uh, get to consolidate itself and slowly over the next 10 years the radio jazz came up with a program uh, to just get uh, this huge calamity in their life and it did by actually making alive uh, because when such a huge earth uh, you know disaster memories create actually he creating the stories of all the so to the stories and that became popular from there it uh, it went from one program to the other Uh, and so by then it became fairly participative and uh okay yes it had a proper team and uh, they opened up a competition across the district and now it's all the communities and people uh, and uh, which abuse women actually Some nine hundred and sixty proverbs were sent to the radio station. Uh, and it it led to, uh, of course, bringing a lot of the anger and. Uh, Uh, so that could be kept, and so slowly they kept moving. Rural sound in their first radio program. So that that's the stage story of radio jazz. <laughs> okay, that's amazing. Um, so this is a question. Everybody, uh, as the last question. Like book is or okay. Um, uh, and you want me to do that? <laughs> okay. My uh, the one which I recommend everyone to go through is In Swaraj by Gandhi Ji. Hmm. Have you heard of it? Just so relevant for our times today. And we do have years really looking in which we were adopting is going to be so messy. Uh, and of course, talking of a range of other things, uh, including and the railways and technologies. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's a, it was an interesting conversation between between uh, himself and an imaginary reader. Uh, <laughs> basically, they. Uh, journey to India, Gujarat, and the country. Reading the uh, how to get used to reading it called the sleeping.
context. I'm enjoying reading now. Uh, if some of you have not read it, there is one book which called Himalaya Bound, hmm. uh, which is written by uh, uh, by a, a photographer and uh, anthropologist called Mike Benini. Uh and he spent um, it's a, it is almost like a photo essay and his time and experience with the one Gujar. Raji National Corbett Park and who are displaced. Uh, and uh, all of what I was talking about, astralists and their life, and uh, beautifully into this book. And he, in fact, he also participated in the Moonlightly as I um, would uh, recommend. Uh, Uh, even if I don't have um, all of all, uh, I there is another interesting one which I uh, I guess it's actually quite remote, so I'm not sure if you don't get it. This is Indian cultures as heritage, which is Roman, hmm. uh, and that. Um, I'll just look a few. Let me begin with four, if not five. <laughs> yeah. uh, what was the other thing you said? Documentaries or talks? Documentaries or talks. Uh, and there are there are many, uh, but uh, let me share share the one little video which I just saw this morning. in Guwahati. Hmm. Okay, then I would really recommend that all of you just go on to Google and check this out. It's a remarkable school set up by two young people in Guwahati. Hmm. Uh, really remarkable. Well, well it's entirely made with bamboo and mud. The school beautiful. Uh, really low income, middle income. The older to older students are teaching the younger students uh, and they get paid for it so that costs so get covered. And uh, I, and it, it's really all about living like this. <laughs> you know, so, so I would definitely recommend uh, that you should see that. much ma'am uh, i just like to thank a, a few people who were instrumental in making okay, this okay okay let me let me tell you my give you my fifth book oh, oh but yes, i'm sure sorry. you have all read it still moved by love which is vinoba you know, bhave hmm okay yes <laughs> yes <laughs> okay sorry go ahead yes so yeah i just like to thank you again but also to a couple of people who made this possible to kyati through her stories and Kati. of course to yes Kati or Kritika? Oh, Kati. Yeah. Ah, yes, Kati works with me with the living. Yes, yes. <laughs> I and, see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, nice. Of course to okay. uh, Neil Kanchaya sir also because he's the one who connected yes, us. Yes. So, um, again, thank you so much, ma'am. And this is something uh, we say at the end of every session to all the participants, which is to please write about the session um, soon, like as soon as it's done, because uh, there were a lot of things that, that were spoken about. Some of them might have stayed with you, but they tend to also leave our minds soon after. And it's very important to document these kind of things. So please yeah. do write and you know share it with your friends, with your family, put it up on social media, or even just keep it uh, with yourself. You never know when you might go back to it. So do write. And yes, thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. 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 Th
Thank you. Thank you, Mira. It's a pity. <laughs> but hopefully, I'll be able to physically engage with you one day. <laughs> yes. Thank <laughs> you.